Hello friends, uh, ever since the paper pattern is changed, physiology syllabus has include, uh, it includes integrative physiology topics. It just comes as a short note for 5 marks uh, and some of the topics are mentioned already. Uh, this is one topic which is integrative physiology. It in, uh, integrates physiology with pediatrics. Uh, so let's see physiology of infancy and pediatric growth. Uh, basically, since this is only a short note for 5 marks, uh, therefore, this content will be more than enough for such a short note. Uh, physiology infant of infancy means uh, what happens in the immediate aftermath once the baby is delivered. Uh, what is the physiology of that infant and neonate uh, in the postpartum immediate postpartum period? First point to be understood is that there is going to be a transition from the intrauterine life to the uh, external world to the extra uterine life as the baby is delivered and therefore from a warm and moist uh, environment of the uterus now the baby has come into the uh, into the outer external world which is cold and dry relatively cold and dry atmosphere so this is going to be the first major a change and major challenge that a newborn baby has to face and therefore the two immediate threats that an infant uh, will face one is hypothermia and the other one is hypoxia so that's the uh, first point of your uh, for your consideration for your answer the two immediate challenges or threats to the newborn baby one is hypothermia as i said from the uterine warm environment now the baby has come into a cold and dry atmosphere as uh, the baby is delivered and of course there is hypoxia now lo let's look at them one by one uh, temperature regulation since the baby immediately faces the uh, threat of hypothermia now uh, fetus has a higher percentage of brown adipose tissue brown fat or brown adipose tissue now this brown it looks brown because of the higher percentage of mitochondria and uh, the other thing that is exceptional in this uh, brown fat is that it has a protein called as uncoupling protein ucp that is uncoupling protein as you are aware uh, mito in the mitochondria the oxidative phosphorylation is coupled with ATP generation. Now, uncoupling protein will uncouple these two processes. ATP generation will be uncoupled from the oxidative phosphorylation so that instead of ATP generation, it generates heat. So, that is the important feature of brown adipose tissue, generation of heat. Uh, well, the percentage is higher in the newborn babies uh, compared to the adults. Adults have only about 10% uh, fat as the brown adipose tissue. Mostly it is yellow and uh, brown adipose tissue in the adults is in the nape of the neck, near the shoulder, etc. But otherwise, in the infants, there is a high percentage. Therefore, they can generate heat to a much greater extent and they need it. And this is called as non-shivering thermogenesis you know our muscle contractions when they shiver that's a shivering thermogenesis that's in adults but in children there would be a non-shivering thermogenesis due to the presence of brown adipose tissue and generation of heat thermogenesis and the second immediate threat as we mentioned will be the hypoxia uh, so far inside the uterus the, the fetus was having gas transfer through the placenta. As soon as the cord is clamped, the baby is delivered, the cord is clamped. Now the baby has to survive independently. And at that very moment, the lungs have not started functioning. They are in a collapsed state. So now baby will immediately face the challenge of hypoxia. And therefore, first thing that happens here is that uh, hypoxia stimulates peripheral chemoreceptors. If you have read respiratory system, uh, you will know that uh, hypoxia is sensed 
by the peripheral chemoreceptors, carotid bodies, aortic bodies and the breathing will be stimulated. At this stage, as you are aware, as soon as the baby is delivered, it starts crying ferociously. Now, this first cry of the neonate is to generate a great negative intrathoracic pressure. This is just a diagrammatic representation. Lungs are collapsed at the time of birth. They have not started functioning yet. And now, therefore, uh, the fetus has to generate a greatly negative intrathoracic pressure. And this crying generates that uh, negative intrathoracic pressure. How much is it? Pressure at the first breath or that first cry of the neonate is almost up in the range of minus 60 centimeters of water. Compare this with the adults which generally have minus 5, minus 7, minus 8 centimeters of water, uh, the intrathoracic pressure. So, this high, highly negative intrathoracic pressure generated by the crying immediately after birth uh, will cause the lungs to begin to distend. So, lungs will slowly begin to distend and uh, they will start their function and that's how the hypoxia will be tackled by the newborn baby. Apart from that, let's also see some other important systems in the uh, in the early periods uh, in the extra uterine life. What about the CVS? Uh, look, blood pressure and heart rate when the baby is delivered. At the time of birth, the blood pressure is 40 mm of Hg. By one week, it increases, it becomes 50 mm of Hg. By one month, it becomes 60 mm of Hg. Well, by this time, uh, the baroreceptor functioning has begun uh, slowly, gradually, the blood pressure uh, will increase. Uh, by one month, it becomes 60. By one year of age, it becomes 70 mm of Hg. And then gradually, it will increase uh, up to an adult level. Uh, mean pressure up to 100 mm of Hg, which is the normal pressure in the adults. And the heart rate also. At the time of birth, obviously, because it's a hypoxic situation, so uh, as a compensation for that, the heart rate uh, is higher, uh, almost in the tune of uh, to the tune of 130 to 140 beats per minute. Then gradually, uh, it settles down to 120, then 110, 100 beats per minute, and so on and so forth. So that's the uh, change in the CVS in a newborn baby and. Uh, even later on during the infancy. Now coming to the CNS, another major uh, change that's going to happen. At the time of birth, as you are aware, myelination of uh, some of the systems is not complete. Like motor system myelination is yet to be completed. So at the time of birth, motor system functioning has not started. Sensory tracts were myelinated even during the intrauterine life. But at the time of birth, particularly motor system, pyramidal tract, they are not myelinated, they have not started functioning. And therefore, at the time of birth, there is extensor plantar response, extensor plantar reflex. When you stimulate the sole of the foot like this, you must have done this in the practicals. Uh, in the adults, there should be plantar flexion and it helps in the walking. But at the time of birth, since and, and this reflex is under the uh, control of pyramidal tract, this process of standing and walking. But at the time of birth, pyramidal tract is not myelinated, its function has not started. Uh, the newborn baby obviously cannot stand on its uh, feet uh, because of this. And therefore, if you stimulate the sole of the foot at the time of birth and thereafter, it will be an extensor plantar reflex. Uh, don't call it Babinski sign. Babinski sign is an extensor plantar response, but it is due to the lesion later on in life. This is simply called extensor plantar reflex. That is, upgoing toes. When you stimulate the sole of the foot, the foot moves like this. The toes move like this. Uh, and by 12 to 18 months of age, the pyramidal tract uh, has got myelinated completely. It has started functioning. And therefore, now, uh, you know, by the one year of age, uh, the child is uh, trying to stand and toddle around and start walking. And that, that is when 
this reflex now uh, is developed completely as plantar flexion when he will put his foot on the ground uh, there will be plantar flexion of the toes so that the uh, grip is there while walking and that helps in the process of uh, walking so that is plantar flexion apart from that uh, some other uh, differences like at the time of birth a child has axial hypermetropia hypermetropia uh, far sightedness or long sightedness and axial means it is because of the shape or axis of the eyeball anterior posterior diameter or axis of the eyeball is uh, different and therefore image is falling uh, beyond the retina that's hypermetropia and then what happens is slowly there is growth of the eyeball along with the growth of the cranium and that is how slowly these growths will uh, match up to each other and finally there will be uh, adult 6 by 6 vision so therefore these are some of the uh, the physiological things or physiological properties at the time of birth and that is how the physiology will progress in the soon aftermath and thereafter.